We're recording now. Okay. Good evening. It's April 24, 2023. This is a public forum called as a special meeting of the Town Council and Finance Committee. It's the first of two meetings tonight. All will use the same Zoom link. The governor recently signed an extension of the act that suspends certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present in the meeting location. However, I'd like to call to your attention that there are in fact seven of us in the town. Um, we also provide this meeting in so that it is available in an adequate alternative pro process. That means you can view it in real time by Zoom, you can attend by phone, you can watch a live broadcast on Amherst Media, channel 17, and you can do live stream on Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the April 24th town council meeting to order at 6.03. Um, I'll call upon each councilor by name at that time. Please let me know that you can hear us and we can hear you. Um, Shalini Baumim. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmers. Present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Uh, Andy Steinberg just entered the room, but needs to set up his computer. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. Thank you. I want to make note on your screen that channel 17 will be moving to channel nine, effective May 2nd, 2023. That is the next time of our town council meeting. And so that Amherst Media for the education, I mean, for the government channel will be moving to channel nine. And we'll try to make that as publicly available as possible. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead for a moment, Andy, while you set up, uh, and then you can call the finance committee meeting to order. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Uh, to make a comment or ask a question, you'll use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties rise, then we need to make sure that we note that and we'll decide what to do at the time. Um, Vice okay. All right, Kathy, would you please call the meeting of the finance committee to order? I believe you've got. I see a, a quorum. I call the town finance committee to order, and I see that we have resident members here. So I who have not uh, signaled they can hear and be heard. So I will call on them as I see them, and I just see Bob Hegner. Bob. Here. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to begin with a brief, brief presentation on six financial orders. We will then move to public comment. Um, since this is a public forum, public comment must equal the amount of time that we also speak. Uh, Andy, are you connected? Why don't you just say present into your mic and we can record that and go on. Present. Okay, got it. Um, so Paul, Sean, and Guilford, uh, we have a one slide that we're showing. It has all six of the appropriations orders on it. And Sean, you're giving us like a one or two sentence description on each. Thank you. Athena, the slide. Thank you. 
Um, so we have six orders. Order number one, FY23 16A, appropriates uh, $713,451 from free cash uh, into a special revenue fund to be used for uh, impacts related to cannabis dispensaries. Uh, these are revenues the town collects that are restricted in, in how they can be used. Um, and so we want to get them out of free cash into a, a special revenue fund. Uh, order FY2304 C appropriates additional funds into the solid waste uh, operating budget for FY23. Um, our uh, costs for tipping fees, which is the expense to have uh, waste removed from the transfer station, um, has exceeded what we or is going to exceed what we budgeted for the year. Um, and we can't have a expense deficit in an enterprise fund. So we are proposing a supplemental appropriation from the retained earnings in the solid waste fund uh, to cover the increase in cost. FY23 13 uh, D rescinds uh, a previous uh, debt authorization for the reuse water project. Um, the town began looking into this reuse water project and um, in our conversations with UMass and, and our long range planning um, determined that we should pause that project. And so we are rescinding uh, the, the balance of the debt authorization. Orders FY23 13 E and FY2309 B uh, both relate to the gravity belt thickener. Uh, this project, like other projects, has come in over budget. It started right before the pandemic, and um, through inflation and, and cost escalation, uh, the cost for this project has exceeded what was previously approved. So, what we are proposing is rescinding the original debt authorization for 2.3 million and replacing it with a new debt authorization for 3.3 million. Um, which is based on an estimate from our uh, engineer for the project. And then the last one, if you scroll down a little bit, Athena. FY2305D uh, is appropriating funds uh, to basically complete the North Amherst Library renovation project. Um, the, the project itself was funded through, with an anonymous donation, and that project is coming to completion. As part of that project, the staff would like to demolish the gas station that is behind the library that was previously purchased and um, connect the two parking lots between the gas station and the, the parking lot outside the North Amherst Library. Uh, so this appropriation uh, would both demolish the gas station and then make some outside um, lay, uh, improvements to the uh, facilities parking lot to connect the two sites. And I will stop there. Um before we go, Andy, Andy, is there anything specific from the Finance Committee you want to mention? Uh, the Finance Committee um, met on uh, Tuesday of last week, discussed all of the proposed orders, um, the, and recommended all of them on unanimous votes for in favor of uh, one member, group voting member, Councillor Absent. And of the three resident members, two were in support and one of the members was absent. The uh, only changes that we uh, discussed were in relation to the uh, cannabis. We requested, we suggested that the motion include the uh, provision that the town manager would report annually to the council on expenditures uh, from the fund that would be established and uh, that there was one change on the gas station and that was based upon public comment and discussion that followed uh, during the meeting on the source of the funds. And, uh, and it was amended appropriately. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is a time for public comment, but Alicia, you have your hand up. Yes, um, just a quick reminder to people in the town room if they can push the button when they speak, because I couldn't hear much of anything. Okay, thank you. I think we need to bring the mics closer, but thank you for that reminder. Okay, this is the time for public comment. Let me note that we're starting at 6.11. Uh, which means we will go to 620. We started at 603, 620. Are there people who would like to make public comment about 
any of these financial orders. Tony Cunningham, you have your hand up. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, uh, Tony Cunningham, District 1. I would like to express my support for the request for 110,000 to be taken out of repurposed capital funds to demolish the gas station on Montague Road and improve the site. I was glad to see that free cash reserves will not be drawn down for this purpose as had been proposed. When in the finance committee meeting last week, Councillor Grismer asked if the financial order for the gas station demolition would need to be reissued to change the source of funds from free cash to repurpose capital, or if it could be amended on the spot. Town manager Paul Bockelman replied that the financial order is the appropriation, that is the total amount being requested, and that the source of funds can be adjusted. He said to do so would be within the framework, which seems logical to me. For the benefit of the public and other councillors, I'd like to draw attention to how differently this was handled compared to the financial order for the school debt authorization. When Councillor Alicia Walker wanted to propose an amendment to the school financial order to do effectively the same thing as was done here for the gas station, to adjust the source of funds in that case so that more would be sourced from reserves, there was great consternation from some councillors and the town manager and many obstacles put in Councillor Walker's way. Councillor Steinberg suggested that it might not be legal, that it might require a new order be drawn up by the manager triggering a delay and restarting the process of notifying the public and holding a forum. The town manager sought a legal opinion from the town's attorney and suggested in the council meeting that a new financial order would have to be drawn up in order to amend the source of funding on the financial order. Councillors opined about the delay that would likely result deterring others from supporting Councillor Walker's amendment. But in the case of the gas station, the financial order was quickly amended on the spot. A finance committee vote was taken with little fanfare and there was no suggestion that this public forum needed to be delayed. To be clear, I think that's the correct path. It is the inconsistency between this case and the one for the school that I want to draw attention to, how easy it was to do something when it is desired by leadership and how difficult it can be when those in charge do not support it. It shouldn't be this hard and rules need to be applied consistently and fairly. For the reuse water project, I'm glad you are rescinding that 5 million debt authorization, but I would like to know more about what the $300,000 of that debt has been spent on and how the town proposes to get that money reimbursed from UMass. Thank you. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment at this time only on the financial orders? There'll be other opportunities, in fact, two for public comment during our regular council meeting. Um, I'm going to ask the town manager, Sean, the uh, finance director, or the director of DPW, whether they are able to answer the question with regard to the uh, that the person has asked that Tony has asked with regard to the three hundred thousand dollars that was spent. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so. The costs to date are for engineering fees. Um, it might have, end up being even a little bit less than that. I've been going through it with Guilford um, because the engineer for this project is also the engineer for the gravity belt. So it might end up being a lower number, um, but it won't be any more than what we've proposed. Um, but it's the cost to date have been for engineering fees. Um, and in terms of recouping it, um, we've had on our radar for a while exploring reuse water uh, fees. Um, and it's something that we plan to take a hard look at in FY24. Um, so that would be one way in the future to potentially recoup some of that. Okay. Again, I'm going to ask if there's anybody else who would like to make public comment with regard to these six financial orders.
We have three more minutes that will be in public comment for these three financial orders. If you would like to make a comment regarding any one of these six financial orders, please raise your hand. Maria Kopecki, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to follow up on um, that last issue. Can uh, Sean maybe explain a little bit more about why that $5 million project was halted? Uh, Guilford, have you have your hand up and Sean, so go ahead, please, Guilford. So the reason the reuse water project was halted is UMass has decided to go another route. They plan to do more geothermal heating around the campus, and they have been exploring and drilling wells to use geothermal heat instead of using the central heating plant, which is uh, oil-fired or natural gas fired system. So the university's kind of taken another approach to how they're going to heat the campus. Tony, did you have your hand up again? Would you like to have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to follow up on what Guilford said. So if it was UMass that decided they no longer wanted to do this project, I guess I'm not clear on why the town is on the hook for that 300,000. This project was always to benefit UMass and we've spent $300,000 on design for something and then they changed their mind. So, it, you know, you, you talked about um, billing for water, Sean, but what I was thinking more was getting back that design cost because I don't think the town should be paying that money. Thank you. Guilford and uh, also has his hand up on this. So it's actually the design money is not money lost. Everything we did can be used in the future. We do see that the town of Amherst will more than likely do want to do a reuse project with or without the university in the future. Um, the reason for that is the reuse will offset potable water uses in town that we're using potable water for now. Irrigation, for instance, or other types of systems in the town that use potable water will be able to replace with reuse water. Um, currently, there are, are no large customers or no large demand for that or a large outside push from the state to tell us to use more of the reuse water. So there will be a point at a time when we will want to install it in the plant. And the work that's been done is not really lost. Everything's laid out. We know how to connect it. We know where to lay the skids out. Um, the only thing that would possibly change if we move forward in five or 10 years is what systems we put in, what brand of uh, reuse uh, RO filters we put in or ultra filtration filters we use. So it's not lost money. It's just a deferred, it's more of a deferred project that we've done because we don't have a current right now customer we want to serve. Are there any other questions with regard to any of the six financial orders that are the focus of this public forum? Seeing none. Uh, so Andy, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, for you to determine if the Finance Committee has any reason to reconsider their vote. And if not, please adjourn the Finance Committee, although they will be joining us during the next meeting. So the question for the Finance Committee, since we're in uh, session for both the committee and for the Council as a whole, is that the committee made recommendations regarding these orders and it's meeting on Tuesday, which I reported at the beginning of the forum. 
And uh, when we hear from the public, we always wanna have the opportunity to um, allow the finance committee to reconsider its recommendations. So I'm gonna just pause for a moment to see if there are any members of the finance committee raising their hand, indicating that they would like to uh, make a motion to reconsider a recommendation that we have made regarding these orders. Seeing that no one has raised their hand, indicating I assume therefore that um, finance committee is in agreement that the uh, recommendations as previously made um, are still the recommendations of the committee and therefore for the purpose of the forum, I adjourn finance committee. Okay. Town council is adjourned for the purpose of this. We will immediately proceed to the town, regular town council meeting, which was posted for 615. Good evening. It's still April 24th. 2023, and this is a regular meeting of the town council. It is the second of two meetings tonight using the same Zoom link. I already mentioned earlier that the governor, governor recently signed an extension of the act that suspends certain provisions of, a, of the open meeting law. This allows us to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, since I mentioned that earlier, I want to note that there are nine counselors in the town room. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 17. Please note, Amherst Media's channel for government will be changing as of May 2nd to Channel 9. It's also available on Amherst Media through live stream. Given the quorum of the council present, at this time at eight at 624, I'm going to call the meeting to order. I want to again make sure everybody can hear and be heard. Shalini Balmil. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. Andy, please call the Finance Committee to order. Call the Finance Committee to order. And I still uh, think that Bob Hegner is the only uh, resident member present. Uh, Bob, can you still hear us? Yes, I can. I'm here. Thank you. We've already discussed what happens with technical difficulties. I just want to make note that there's no change in the order of the agenda as posted. Uh, on the announcements, we'll move to those. And our next regular town council meeting is May 1st at 630. We have several committee meetings coming up as well. But there are some additional announcements we would like to make sure that you are aware of. First of all, the Amherst Heritage, the African, the Amherst's African Heritage Reparations Assembly, AHRA, has a survey out that you can take a picture literally of that uh, that's on your screen, and that takes you directly to the survey. You can also find that particular poster in your packet. I also want to bring a tent, call attention to the fact that although the deadline to register to vote is passed, we have, in fact, you are still available to register to vote by mail and ballot. To do that, you have to go to the town clerk's office. That's also where you go if you're going to do an absentee ballot. We began today at 8 o'clock having early in-person voting on the fl first floor meeting room of Amherst Town Hall. And that continues through Thursday between 8 a.m. and 4.30.
This is all regarding the debt exclusion vote for the elementary school. In-person voting begins on at seven o'clock on May 2nd and ends at 8 p.m. I also wanna make note that if you have received a ballot by mail and you do not use it, you can bring it to vote with you to be either in-person voting at early voting or in-person voting on May 2nd. If you do not, if you would like to know where you are supposed to vote since some precincts have changed, that is also on the notice here at www.secperiodstate.ma.us dash where do I vote mass? Where do I vote? Okay. And I did test out that link and it works, but let me just caution you, put the name of the road in and or the street, but don't put the word street or road because that goes in the next line down. Andy, you have your hand up. Yes, I just want to point out that your prior posted announcements listed a finance committee meeting for tomorrow that has in fact been canceled. Okay. The next finance committee meeting is May 5th at 5. At, it's May 5th at what time? One. One o'clock p.m. That's Friday, May 5th, 1 o'clock p.m. That's also a change. Kathy, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment on, on mail ballots in terms of my experience a year ago. Ours never arrived. So we went in person, and all I had to do is say I didn't have it, and I signed something to make sure I didn't vote twice. But okay. in case you requested one, you can walk in without it in your hand. So Lynn suggested bringing it, but if it didn't come, so I'm just adding that as a note, right? Michelle. Thank you. I just wanted to add, Lynn, to the announcement on the AHRA survey for folks who might be in the audience. It is open to all community members, regardless of identity, um, and it will be open until at least May 5th. Thank you. Okay. We just want to mention a couple other things. Uh, we will be gathering um, in front of town hall on Thursday, April 27th at four o'clock in honor of Jewish Heritage at Jewish American Heritage Month. And on May 7th, from noon to 4 p.m., there'll be an Asian Pacific Islander celebration. With that, I want to call on Anika, who would like to particularly mention an honor bestowed on one of our staff. Yes, thank you. I'm going to need to refer to my notes because uh, this lady we're about to talk about has a long list of honors here. Uh, so this past Friday, the 21st, Jennifer Moyston, the Assistant Director of our DEI Department, was nominated by our state rep, Mindy Dom, to receive the Black Excellence on the Hill Award. This honor comes through Massachusetts representatives and senators who each select one amazing community member deserving of this award. Uh, the powerhouse that is our state rep, Mindy Dom, made an excellent choice in nominating Jennifer. Um, so aside from we all... No, many of us know Jennifer is the assistant director of our DEI department. She serves on just a few boards and committee. Uh, she is currently the vice president of the Survival Center, where she co-chairs two committees. Uh, she's a board member with the Community Action of Pioneer Valley, Pioneer Valley rather, where she serves on the governance committee. She's a co-chair of the Amherst Chamber of Commerce um, Equity Task Force. She's a member of the AHRS PGO, and in her free time, she coaches Special Olympics. Uh, Jennifer was raised here in Amherst. She's lived her whole life, and she's been involved with community service since childhood. Um, I do know this firsthand, um, as we did grow up together. Um, and Jennifer, uh, not only does she have such a pulse on this community that she loves, uh, she's also been a, she's also utilized a lot of the services within the organizations that she now uh, leads, um, collaborates with, and also, you know, finds joy and honor in being in a position to give back and play it forward. Um, personally, I would like to 
uh, thank Jennifer when I first um, returned to the area. She, you know, joined and, and uplifted me um, in support of being, you know, supporting um, descendants, bringing forward their family history that wasn't here. And I deeply thank Jennifer for that and have enjoyed collaborating with her ever since. And um, before I end, I'd like to note that I believe it's May 6th, nod to Paul, will be her 10th anniversary working here at Town Hall. I'm not sure what anniversary that is, um, but I'm sure it will be a nice day here in Town Hall. And um, I'm sure I speak for all of us here and on Zoom and sending Jennifer a very deep-rooted and heartfelt congratulations on her award. <laughs> Thank you. And Jennifer, congratulations. We're going to move on now to the hearing. This is the hearing regarding the regional school budget. We will later on have regular general public comment as well. So let me just make a comment or two. Public hearings are an opportunity for residents to address the council. You may do this orally. You may do this in general public comment or by writing to the town councilors, or any number of other ways. While some public hearings are required by Mass General Law, others may be required by the charter or rules of procedure. And the council may also designate a council committee to hold a public hearing. Um, hearings authorized by the council have precedent over other presentations. Uh, we have to first hear from the petitioner and in this case, that will be Doug Slaughter representing the school committee and re representing the regional schools. There'll be questions from counselors. We'll then go to public questions and comments and then conclude by um, questions from counselors. We do need to then have a motion to close the public hearing. So with that, I'm going to call on Doug uh, to uh, make a brief presentation regarding the regional school committee the regional school budget, et cetera, okay? Thank you, I'll be extraordinarily brief since the last time we spoke, which is a couple of weeks ago, nothing's really changed. So just to remind you, there are four pieces of action that you will take potentially tonight or certainly need to take relative to our budget. One will be relative to the uh, actual assessment methodology, uh, which will, because we use something other than what the state uh, dictates as this, the, their statutory method, uh, each of the four communities must agree to use that method and, and take an active vote relative to that methodology. Uh, number two, we'll, we'll, we'll have you, you know, take action relative to the actual overall budget amount and the assessment amount that is uh, Amherst's uh, portion of that. Uh, the third thing will be uh, for our capital program, it'll be the amount of uh, budget, particularly to pay debt that we've already incurred. Uh, and so there'll be the finance, uh, I mean, excuse me, the assessment to the town of Amherst relative to our regional agreement method for, for debt that will uh, be one of the orders to, to take into consideration. And then finally, the, there is uh, a debt authorization, which is new borrowing that we have uh, sought uh, or, or seeking uh, your feedback on. Um, and again, the, the school committee has voted for this debt authorization. You as a, as a council have the opportunity to uh, accept or reject that or take no action. Um, and so those are the four pieces. Um, so just to, to get into the assessment method, we're going to use the same one we used last year. Uh, it uses a five-year rolling average of the minimum local contributions, which is the statutory method of a part of the assessment. That which is above that is done through the regular assessment method, which is based on a five-year rolling average of students. Um, and so that's how the assessment method will work. And we have guardrails of 4% for uh, maximum and, and minimum adjustment for any given community. Um, obviously, it's rare that Amherst would be able to, to tolerate that or would be uh, considered under that, that sort of guardrails, but it is helpful for our three smaller communities to have that, that boundary of 4% to help uh, frame their planning uh, in, in this year and in future years. And two of the, two of the four communities um, are, are at that 4% uh, limit. So it does reduce the amount of total assessment uh, that we can in, uh, uh, request from the four towns in that regard. Um, so the overall budget, uh, inclusive of all funding sources, as well as the assessment to the towns is $33,703,908. Uh, the assessment to the town of Amherst will be 
$17,772,017. Uh, and that is a 3% increase over last year. And I appreciate and thank you uh, on behalf of myself and, and all the folks here uh, of being able to go to 3% instead of just two and a half, which is what you initially uh, had projected was possible for, for the town of Amherst. And so that's very helpful to our budget. Um, our debt payment, uh, the overall debt assessment is $476,400. Amherst portion of that is $372,018. And then the authorization is, you know, new borrowing authorization uh, for capital projects. And the total amount involved there is $685,000. And so those are very, very quickly, and hopefully all of this is in your packet so that you've had a chance to look at it. Uh, those are the four things in front of you for consideration and for public comment in, in this hearing. And so um, I'm happy to entertain any questions that anyone has relative to those. Okay, Sean, you have your hand up. Uh, just one clarification: the, um, the the debt assessment gets approved as part of our operating budget, um, so you won't have to act on that tonight. You'll the, the debt authorization, you will, but the the assessment for debt that's been previously authorized um, will come to the council with the rest of the budget on May first. My apologies. Sorry. However, we do have four motions, and one is that we have to vote to agree to do this out of the cycle of the regular budget because it relates to the fact that the other schools, uh, the other, I'm sorry, the other municipalities have town meeting, and those town meetings will be completed before we finish our review of our annual budget. More about that later. With that, the floor is open for public comment with regard to the regional school budget. The first question I have is, are there any questions from counselors? Seeing none, then I'm going to move and ask if there are questions or comments from the public. seeing none so i'll come back to any questions or comments from counselors before we close move to close the hearing kathy thank you um thank you doug i don't have any questions on the orders before us but i have a request that as uh, my understanding is that uh as tough as the coming year is for us. The year after that is tougher. Um, so I, I'm hoping that we could have discussions a bit earlier on the regional budget than uh, end of April, uh, as, as we start to say, what, what can we as a council be doing at the state level, not just at the local level, and where can we be helpful? Are there any other comments at this time? Seeing none then, I'm going to move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Um, Councilor Haneke is second, Mandy Jo seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote to close the public hearing. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Ernie. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. And Shalini Balmim. Yes. It's unanimous. So with that, we are going to move on to general public comment. If you would like to make public comment, uh, please raise your hand at this time. I'm, we did, no, we're voting later. Want to, uh, uh, yes, why don't we go ahead and adjourn the finance committee? Um, I'm going to just take notice of the fact that since there was no public comment that I'm going to assume 
that therefore there's no basis for changing recommendations from the finance committee regarding the regional budget and just adjourn the finance committee. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on now to general public comment. Uh, any general public comment? Seeing none, then we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed after I go through the list. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. Uh, the following, uh, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 9A to D, approval of town manager appointments for the Affordable Housing Trust Board of Trustees, the Disability Advise Access Advisory Committee, the Historical Commission, and the Local History District Historic District Commission. 11A to B, approval of the following meeting minutes, April 3rd, 2023, Special Town Council meeting minutes, public forum on elementary school building funding, April 3rd, 2023, regular Town Council meeting minutes. Are there any that people would like removed? Seeing none, uh, then we are going to, I need a second. Shane seconds. Thank you. Are there further questions? We're seeing none. We're going to move on to Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Hi. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Thank you. We now begin the process of, oh, I'm sorry. There are no resolutions and proclamations, although we'll have several next week, I believe. And we have presentations and discussions. There are none of those today. Um, we will now move to separate consideration of the FY24 Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget. And I was reminded by a question from one counselor that it's important for us to understand why we have to do this first vote. And it's based on charter section 5.5C and it's included in the last sentence. If the town council determines it's prudent to separately consider and act on a portion of the budget due to legal requirements, agreements with regional entities of which Amherst is a participant or for other substantial cause, it may do so by roll call vote provided that the town council complies with section 5.5 A and B. In other words, because we consider the regional school budget separately from our budget, that is why we are being asked to vote. And I mentioned earlier, it's because our budget is now, as because we are the city known as the town of Amherst, is now after the other towns have their town meetings. So um, I'm gonna put a motion on the floor seek a second and then if there's questions uh we'll go to that so the motion in accordance with section 5.5 c of the amherst home rule charter and in compliance with section 5.5 a and 5.5 b of the amherst home rule charter to separately consider and act on the amherst pelham regional school district budgets and assessment method for fiscal year 2024 because it would be prudent to do so due to the regional agreement with the three other towns in the regional school district. Is there a second? Shane second. seconds. Shane, Kathy Shane is second. Are there questions or comments? Seeing none, 
then we're going to move to a vote. I'm going to start with Lynn Griesmer, who's an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Bowman. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna De Devlin Gothier. Aye. Thank you. So we now move on to the first of the council orders, which is FY 20 02, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District FY 24 budget and appropriating the town of Amherst share of the budget assessment. Um, so the motion is as follows, and I seek a second. In accordance with Charter Section 5.5, .5, having been referred to the Finance Committee, having been recommended by the Finance Committee, Committee report of April 24, 2023, a public hearing held on April 24, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 3, 2023, to adopt Council Order FY24-02, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District FY 2024 budget and appropriating the town of Amherst share of the budget assessment as shown on page 16 of the motions. Is there a second? Second. That's Mandy Joe. Are there questions? I just want, to, I'm going to ask or make sure that we all clearly understand. If in the process of the House deliberating on the budget, the Senate releasing their budget, conference committee and going on to the governor to be signed and passed, additional money becomes available in, in items appropriate to the schools, should we assume that that will automatically be added to these budgets? Paul or Sean? So that was a question. Um, to... It was a question. Okay, I couldn't tell if that was a, a council, a council focus question. Um, so, if the state, if the final state budget that's voted is better than what we faced our budget on, um, we always have the option, like we did this past year, to reconsider um, and propose something in the fall. Um, and some of that depends on how much better it is. Last year, it was significantly better. Um, if you remember, the final uh, the final voted unrestricted general government aid was about double what we were expecting. So um, small changes, we likely would not come back. Um, if it's a substantial um, difference, it's something we would look at and reconsider in the fall. Okay, let's hope for some big changes. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, yes, there is. Pam. Yes, thank you. Um, in in light of that comment, if um, if there is additional money that that comes in from the state, and the council decides that um, it would be better to replace uh, some of the seventeen seven seven two uh, amount with additional state aid, this our amount, our appropriation amount, can also be reduced. Is that correct? Can you um, clarify, sorry, some okay. of the 17, seven? My understanding of the $17 million that- The Amherst, regional assessment? Right, that, that Amherst is assessed and, and essentially owes to the school system. Should additional money come in from the state, is there the opportunity to, I'm not suggesting I want to do it, but is there the opportunity to uh, utilize that money in lieu of what the town itself is appropriating for our share? Um, so our share um, that we are appropriating to support the number in front of us today, it's based on a combination of sources, which include state aid. Um, so it wouldn't replace, it wouldn't replace, there's no specific uh, funding source like state aid or local receipts that's supporting the 17 million for the region. It's a combination of all of our revenues. Again, we put all of our state aid, our local receipts, our property taxes, 
they make up all, all of our revenues and then we parse that out um, to different departments, but we don't specifically assign individual revenue sources to different departments. So if state aid comes in higher, it would increase that overall pot of revenue that we have, um, which could again then be considered uh, to increase certain appropriations if, um, if it made sense at that time. The one thing to keep in mind too, again, with the regional schools, like we did in the fall, it's a little more complicated because um, it's an assessment and we're one of four towns and we can, the town of Amherst can do things more nimbly than uh, the other three towns that have to rely on town meetings. And, you know, they typically have maybe two per year. Um, so if there was any action again, like we did last fall to um, put more money into the region, it would have to likely be done the same way we did it last year, which is in the form of a gift, uh, which is what we did. We, we couldn't technically increase their assessment um, without the other three towns voting. So um, just something, again, to keep in mind, it's a little more complicated with the region. Pam, does that answer your question? Um, in part. Okay, is there a further question you wanna ask? You're muted. Okay, uh, Mandy Jo? Yeah, I just want the council and everyone to keep in mind that the region also gets its own cherry sheet numbers and its own separate state aid apart from the state aid that we get for not just general government functions, but also for our K to six schools. They get their own dedicated state aid that's not part of this assessment number, um, the 17 million and all. It's, it's a part of the total. Um, budget number of the 32 million or whatever it is for them, um, 22, right. 20, so not 32, like 22 million, um, that they get part of that extra money between our assessment and the other town's assessment and their total budget is state aid that we don't see as a town that just the region sees. So for example, they get directly the transportation for regional schools. That's not part of what we're voting here. That goes to them directly. This is what the town of Amherst has committed to our regional schools. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to move to a vote. And in this case, I'm going to start with Mandy Jo. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Greesmers and I, it's unanimous. Okay, we need to move on to the next council order, which is FY24 03A, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District debt authorization for FY2024. I want to just point out no vote is actually required, but it has been our practice to vote on this. Uh, and so in the spirit of that, I'm going to make the motion and seek a second. In accordance with Charter Section 5.5, having been reviewed by the Finance Committee, having been recommended by the Finance Committee report of April 24, 2023, a public hearing held on April 24, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 3rd, 2023, 2023 to adopt council order FY24-03A, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District debt authorization for FY 2024 as shown on page 17 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there questions? In the spirit of an earlier comment that was made about talking regarding talking about the school regional school budget earlier rather than later, we have also discussed from time to time uh, making sure that we talk about the um, capital uh, authorizations that are expected to be coming, some of which are pretty scary. 
and um, we would do that sometime, we hopefully this fall, even before we get to financial indicators. Okay, seeing no questions, I'm going to move to the vote. I'm going to start with Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. It's unanimous. And the final is approval of the assessment method. And the motion, which I seek a second for, is the following in accordance with chapter, with charter section 5.5, having been referred to the Finance Committee, having been recommended by the Finance Committee report of April 24th, 2023, a public hearing held on April 24th, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 3rd, 2023, to adopt. Council Order FY24-01, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District assessment method for FY24, as shown on page 15 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Are there questions or comments? Seeing none, then we're going to go to a vote and we start with Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shelley Balmilne? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. It's unanimous. We have completed the regional school budget uh, votes. And um, we'll go on to. Should we thank Doug? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, we should first of all thank Doug. And Doug, thank you first of all. I, for some people, this may seem a little routine. I just want to mention this isn't routine. This is something that the school district spends a lot of time on preparing and sweating over and bringing to us. And then it's recommended to the council, then it goes on to the finance committee. Doug is there answering questions the entire time and then it comes back to the council. So thanks, Doug. Please extend our thank you to the school superintendent. Absolutely. And um, may we look for great money from the state legislature. Fingers are crossed. Thank you all so much. I'll thank share you. your, your vote with, with the superintendent. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Um, now, those six orders <laughs> that we just had the public forum for, we actually, because they're financial orders, we have to vote them separately. So just, I, I tried, I actually tried to see whether there's any way I could put this in a consent agenda and I was told no. So hang in there. I think we'll get through the full alphabet of the counselors at least once tonight. Okay. Um, let me make sure I start with the first one. In accordance with Charter Section 5.6, having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a public forum held, a public forum held on April 24th, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 13th, 2023, to adopt Council Order FY23 16A, an order appropriating free cash to the Cannabis Impact Revenue Fund with the understanding that the town manager will report annually to the council on expenditures from the special revenue fund. As shown on. As shown. On page 18. As shown on page 18. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. 
uh, is there questions, are there questions with regard to this fund or the amendment that was made? Pam. Thank you. Um, I raised this question before and I would just appreciate a little bit more explanation. And that is since we, under, we understand from um, all sources that the, the impacts, the legislation, the um, um, punishment and, and whatever uh, related to cannabis has directly impacted um, many, many in the community uh, negatively. The question that I would raise again is that um, I'd like to hear a little bit more explanation between what is uh, the impact revenue fund and um, and our taxes that are, <clears throat> excuse me, generated by um, by cannabis sales, knowing that the the money generated by cannabis sales is going into our reparations fund, has there not been any discussion at all about something like this cannabis impact money also being contributed in part to that fund? That's the question. Okay. Um Paul or Sean, which one of you wants to address that? I can start, Paul, you can jump in if you want. Um, so it's not that we haven't had that conversation, it's that there's um, there's not a precedent that we can find in the state um, that where that's where, uh, been, where that action has been taken um, that we could look to as a model. Um, so I think again, and I, I'm sorry this response wasn't satisfying, but um, there's some gray area when it comes to these impact fees. So um, to clarify the, what we're putting towards reparations is not the taxes um, itself. We're putting a, a like amount from free cash and into a stabilization fund to, um, for that purpose. Um, and these are not the taxes. So the, what, the money we're talking about here are the uh, fees that are outlined in individual uh, host community agreements that each dispensary signed with the town when they first got their, their right to operate. Um, and the law says that the funds must be used um, to basically mitigate the impacts of the dispensaries. And so, you know, there's there's broad interpretation there um, that can be applied and, but ultimately comes down to, you know, does anyone want to challenge it? So I think we've been very cautious in how we use those funds today. As you can see, we haven't used any of them and, and what we're proposing are pretty straightforward. Um, I think once we get these into the fund, you know, we will continue to work with legal counsel and, and look at other communities as models um, to see how they've use these funds. Every, every community is a little bit different because the dispensaries can have different impacts. Again, I'll point to Northampton where the dispensary there um, had huge traffic impacts uh, in the area that they'd have police officers and, uh, you know, look at their, their traffic configuration. We haven't seen that here. So um, yeah, all that's to say every community is different and, and that's something we have looked into, but we haven't gotten a definitive response. Paul? Yeah, so I would just add that this is a developing field. Um, in terms of how people are allocating their cannabis impact funds, um, it, it, everything that's, that Sean said, but there are some towns that are in some communities that are having a broader implication uh, interpretation of how these funds can be used. A lot will be uh, developed from the Cannabis Control Commission, which is reviewing a lot of what the expectations are for impact um, host community fees, host community agreements, can what they can pay for and things like that. So I think, we are very cautious, as Sean said, in terms of what we're putting this money towards, uh, because we'll we are it's a good move to put this into a separate fund so it can be purposely accounted for. So if someone says, "What did you use that that impact money for?" we can point directly to how it was allocated. Okay, Dorothy. Well, I have um, two questions. Um, <clears throat> I mean, first is a is is okay. I think there's been some discussion amongst people that possibly this, some of this money could go for youth activities or youth support services, um, which I think could relate to impact of cannabis in a community. Um, so I want to know about the what, the what the possibilities of that are. And the other thing is um, some of the funds connected with cannabis may not be here that long. Is this one of the ones that is a time limited, like first three years or four years? Right. So the, yeah. those are my questions. The limits yeah. of the money and could be used for youth. Yeah. So in terms of limits, um, again, I think there's lots of ideas like that that sound like they could be viable. Um, so I don't think there's a 
and that's I think that's an option um, supporting youth uh, in the community. Um, in terms of the time limit, yeah. So the especially with the new legislation, there are now strict time limits um, as to how you collect host community impact fees and how long you can um, collect them and what you can collect them for. So this is a revenue source we expect will dwindle in the coming years to eventually be zero or or very little. Um, maybe not zero all the way, but very little. Okay, Andy. Getting back to Pam's original question, she was asking about the connection. To, can we make a connection to reparations? And having dealt with the impact fee question for quite a while, I think the answer is probably no. And the reason that I say that is that the um, argument that we were making for why reparations in amount wasn't a direct payment but was to be guidance for the amount that would be uh, proposed to be transferred uh, to the Reparations Stabilization Fund uh, was because of a recognition that um, prior to the legalization of marijuana, that um, there was racial disparity in how um, people were treated who were being arrested and uh, brought uh, and prosecuted for uh, marijuana uh, in law infractions, and that therefore um, there was a feeling that this was an appropriate place to to look. Um, the uh, money that we're talking about, talking about impact, is not the impact of what the law was. For legalization, it's about the effects of the legalization and the impact that has. And so when you start looking forward, um, it's uh, difficult to craft uh, a reason why that becomes an impact and why it's consistent with the law and the regulations. And uh, I think that's part of the distinction that we need to bear in mind. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, I just want to add that I'm really glad to see this money is going into an account. I think um, Paul and Sean are absolutely right um, to be cautious about this. I've been following it, and um, I do think that the that it's going to even become more stringent in terms of, you know, how it can be used, and that, as Paul said, different communities are sort of interpreting it broadly, and um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, sort of uh, analyzing different communities and the ways that they're using it. So I, I just want to share my support and appreciation for setting it up and getting it somewhere <laughs> separate um, so that we can follow what's happening and make the right decisions based on that. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, how much did we move to this account again? So the amount would be what we've collected um... Uh, through this year, which was 713,451. Okay. Um, so again, there will likely be a little bit more that we will come back in the future and, and ask for a, a similar type of action. Okay. And have we spent any of this money? Nope. None, none of it's been spent to date. Um, the memo did outline two proposed expenditures. One, um, the vaping curriculum um, and vaping um, equipment for the schools. And then the other one to offset some of our uh, administrative costs for managing the host community agreements. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. We start with Dorothy Pam. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Balmill. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. It's unanimous. The next one is regarding the uh, increase in the town solid uh, waste enterprise funding. So, in accordance with chapter. Charter Section 5.6, having been reviewed by the Finance Committee, a public forum held on April 24th, 2023, 
notice which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 13th, 2023, to adopt Council Order FY04C, an order appropriating a supplemental increase to the Town of Amherst Solid Waste Enterprise Fund operating budget for fiscal year 2023, as shown on page 19. Is there a second? Second. Are there questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Did you just set, was there a second? Just sorry. To I'm south. Yes, there Panicky was. seconded. Okay, yeah. sorry. Apologies. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Belmil? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers? Aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. And Dorothy Pam? Yes. Thank you. It is unanimous. The next one is re a rescission of an un unissued bond. And so it's to adopt Council Order FY23 13D, an order rescinding authorization but unused bonds originally approved by vote taken under Council Order 21 09D, reuse water as shown on page 20. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> We're trading places on who's going to be second now. Okay, Mandy Jo got that one. All right, are there any questions or comments? Okay, uh, we're going to begin with Kathy, thank you. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmoon? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. And Pam Rooney? Yes. Okay. The next one's also rescinding money. This is for the gravity belt thickener. To adopt Council Order FY23 13E, an order rescinding authorized but unused, unissued bonds originally approved by a vote of, taken under Council Order 21 09C, gravity belt thickener, as shown on page 21. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, are there questions? Okay, then we're going to go to Andy. Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Bellman? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. And the next one is actually reauthorize, are now authorizing money for the same um, gravity belt thicker. So in accordance with Charter, sec cha you know, Charter Section 5.6, Having been reviewed by the Finance Committee of Public Forum held on April 24th, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 13th, 2023, to adopt Council Order FY23 09B, an order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund capital projects, bond authorization for gravity belt thickener, as shown on page 22. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Okay, then we're going to Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelly Palmilne. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. 
Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmerson, aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. It's unanimous. And the final one, which this is the order that the source was changed. And uh, the motion is in accordance with charter section 5.6, having been reviewed by the finance committee, a public forum held on April 24th, 2023, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on April 13th, 2023 to adopt council order FY 23-05D, an order appropriating funds for a portion for a portion of the town of Amherst Capital Program, demolition of the gas station located at 24 Montague Row and site improvements as shown on page 23 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there questions or comments? Alicia. Um, yes, I'm wondering, is there um, a reason for the timing of this order? Like, why are we hearing this now? I'm going to ask Paul or Sean to respond to that. Uh, Guilford would probably be the best to speak to the progress okay. of the building. Guilford. Um, so we're asking now, um, because as we were looking at opening the completing the project and opening a new library, um, we're set for a completion date of August of this year. And there was a lot of discussion about it. it would be nice if we could have the garage down and have the site completely finished. So you have a complete full project and not the library project and still have half the, pro half the site still covered with the old garage and the parking lots kind of melded together with the existing pavement. When we get, take this money, we'll actually clean up, take the garage down, clean up the site, regrade it, and actually pave the parking lot. If you see the site plan, we're just taking the new parking lot and mushing it into the asphalt to the old garage parking lot. So we'll clean that up. It'll be completely redone, and the rest of the building will be taken care of, and everything will be one complete project. Okay. Pam? Thank you. Yeah, that, that answered part of my question that there is in fact a site plan that will that looks at the uh, entire site the the second part of that is does that also include um a more formal um reorganization of the of the traffic in at that intersection and the second and then just a comment i appreciated what um tony cunningham said earlier that it seems that we can amend these orders um fairly easily, and yet there was such difficulty trying to do it uh, earlier this this year. I, I will only address the first part of that question. Okay. The, um, the All the work we've been doing on the library site is completely with the mind and set that there'll be some change to the alignment of Sunderland Road and Montague Road. So everything I'm doing is not to interfere with a potential change in the, that alignment. So that's kind of why I, I, I have the project is, is there will be a traffic and intersection improvement project coming next once we meet with the residents in the area and actually start ironing out more of what that intersection road project will be. Okay. Kathy? Uh, yeah, it we can, um, in, answered a couple of these questions when this went through the planning board and site board review there was a real discussion on the site including this on on where the road would go parking spaces would go and landscaping so i think what we could do lynn is get that into the record for the councilor so people can see that and one of the issues with the gas station in terms of timing I live in North Amherst, so I probably know more about this than I would otherwise know about it. Is the gas station could be used for staging while the construction was going on. Otherwise, we could have just removed it when all the construction truck were there, but they including, you know, a garage where you could put stuff safely in it. So it's it's had a function while the building went on rather than just knocking it down right at the beginning. There was always the plan to 
get rid of it. Okay, Dorothy. Well, Kathy alluded to landscaping. I just wanted to make sure that there was plans for trees, shrubs, grass in that area. Um, Cause it's gonna be really wonderful. And I mean, driving by it and seeing the colors coming on, it's really exciting. Um, so I'm glad it's gonna be the complete package. And I really appreciate that Guilford is thinking ahead to the, I guess, Kathy's apotheosis, which would be the restructuring of that traffic intersection in North Amherst which I think we would all appreciate when that comes. So thank you, thank you, Guilford, for doing it that way. Thank you, Alicia. Um, does the demolition, or, or if there were not to be a demolition of the garage, would that prevent or delay the opening of the actual library? Um, no, it would not delay the opening of the library, but you would have the, new side of the project, the new library and the new parking area for the library. And then you'd still have the old asphalt and the old layout of the garage. So it would be two different views of the area. Alicia. Uh, what was the, because I, I heard you say that um, the plan was always to get rid of the garage. And so what was the original plan and where we thought the money would come from? The, the original plan was to wait until the library was completely completed and then ask for the money to get rid of the garage and do that separately. But the thought process as the project moved on was it's such a small site, it would look strange to have the old garage and the parking lot not 100% new when we open the new library in August. Alicia, you have another question? Um, no, I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Guilford. That was very helpful. Um, I think my concerns with this is that I'm not understanding why it has become a more urgent need of happening now rather than the original plan. Um, because we, you know, I'm looking at all of the other things in the town that we have been saying we do not have funding for um, and that our budget is so tight and how or why we would make something happen for just an aesthetic reason when we have very serious other things like that could benefit from this money. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Lynn, can, can I say one I'm more I'm sorry, thing? Guilford, please go I, ahead. Sorry. Um, I also just want to let you know that Ernie's will still be renting part of the parcel. So when the garage comes down, Ernie's will still be there. So the parcel will still be making some money. It does make uh, some revenue for the town at this time. Um, we're renting that spot out to Ernie's to store cars. Um, so that will continue. I just, I didn't mention that earlier. I just wanna make sure I mentioned it before you finish. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll begin this vote with Alicia Walker. Um, I really appreciate this project and all of the work. And while I do look forward to seeing the project complete, I will have to vote no because I do not understand the timing. Okay, Jeremy? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. The vote is 12 in favor, one in, one opposed, no abstentions, and no absence. Uh, thank you for all your votes tonight. And Guilford, thank you. We have made it through all of those votes. We've now made it through many votes tonight so far, but we still have a few more to go. Um, Guilford, thank you. Uh, Sean, I believe we're also done with the financial items. You're welcome to stay, but you know, 
you might have something better to do at this hour of the night. So thanks. Yes, both. I'll see you next week. Yeah, okay. Um, we're going to now deal with two items that have come from CRC. Uh, and I'm going to let Mandy Joe explain those, although there is a very significant explanation in your packet from CRC. The first item, and I'm going to ask since this one is so long, that um, you uh, post place it up on the board. It's a rescission of zoning priority directive to town manager. I'm sorry, I didn't mention this in advance. I think it's right there. And if you could enlarge it for the public. So um, let's put the motion on the table and it's to rescind the following zoning priorities. The town council voted on January 4th, 2021 to direct town manager to work on uh, fixing the BL adding BL district to footnote B, adding footnote A to maximum bot coverage and maximum building coverage, revise the apartments definition, demolition delay, bylaw revisions, remove footnote M, work with the council to begin a conversation on housing type expansion in preparation for meeting on September 1st, 2021, priorities below, dimensional regulations in the RG and RVC, lower barriers to development of duplexes and triplexes, frontage regulations for residential zones, look at appropriateness of use table for VC, what kind of businesses are allowed or encouraged in VC districts, food, entertainment services, things that make community and meet basic needs within walking distance, transportation issues may not be zoning or CRC. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mandy Joe, as chair of CRC. So as chair of CRC, um, CRC voted um, to recommend that the council rescind these priorities. Um, and the vote was a, I'm trying to make it unanimous with one absent. Um, these priorities, as the motion says, were stated, were voted to direct the town manager back in 2021, approximately two years ago. Um, and well, two and a half years ago now. Um, and there was a lot of work done on a number of them. Um, the list does not actually include some because we would still like the manager to be working on one, particularly one regarding um, design guidelines. Um, and so this, this list doesn't include that or anything that we actually did work on. Uh, but CRC makes this recommendation basically because it's an old list and CRC has started discussions about potentially coming up with a new list of priorities. Um, in the last two and a half years, the council and CRC has learned that the more specific you are, the harder it is for the planning board to be create the planning department to be creative in drafting and dealing with um, zoning amendments and priorities and all. And so with that, our recommendation is to clear the slate on this. And as we talk, we will probably be back to the council with recommendations related to other potential zoning priorities for the council to discuss. And I'll talk about the second motion afterward. Are there questions? Kathy? Uh, yeah, it's more a future looking question. Um, you know, before the council was seated, the planning board was talking about a range of things that they thought would be might be good ideas. Are we also asking them to give us their list? So it, that's a question rather than we come up with a list, but actually ask them to give us their list, you know, whether it's design guidelines, but that seems to me a more constructive and productive approach. So I don't need an answer right now, but I just think it's a way of doing this. As you, I agree with that being less specific and be more, what would be a good place to be starting and why? Um, Cause they've been thinking about this, not just the planning board, but the planning staff. Yeah, so CRC's had exactly one discussion on potential future zoning priorities. Um, we will be continuing that discussion at this coming week's meeting. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. I do know if council hasn't been following, the planning board has been having their own discussions about potential changes. Um, and I, I know at least a number of C 
DRC members have been following those discussions and so are up to date on what that is and certainly going into our discussions, but we will keep that in mind. And as we proceed with ours, we'll figure out, we're trying to figure out another way forward on how we all relate to each other. Kathy, is there any further comment or question? No, and I'm totally in support of the rescission. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, just give a brief context that this uh, discussion came about because I think right before our council retreat, uh, you, Lynn, had asked mm -hmm. all the committees to go through kind of what was left over from the last council. So that's, so it, it wasn't sort of random. This is what I would call a cleaning up business. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Jennifer. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I guess I just had some questions about the direction we're going, not so much the motion on the table, but the implication of the motion on the table. Um, when we, in the last council, um, made the motion that uh, made the list that we're now rescinding, you know, it wasn't so much the specific list that I was um, uh, involved with i was trusting crc but there were certain principles that we were after and i think we had had substantial discussions about what else distinguishes portable housing and then family housing making housing opportunities available for um, families to move into who had children or not but were um uh not necessarily in the portable category, but not in the uh, rental category either. And then the third was recognizing commercial development and the need to diversify our tax base so that it's not um, as dominated by residential uh, as it is um, because of the consequences that that has created for the community in uh, growth. So I was curious how you're dealing with uh, priorities since uh, the idea is to give guidance but be less specific and then flowing from that, how the council as a whole and the community are gonna be involved in that discussion. As I said, we've had exactly one discussion on this, um, and and um, you know Jennifer was right. This particular motion came out of the Lynn had asked the committees to, and I couldn't give really an update about any of these because we hadn't discussed them in so long in committee, and so I brought the discussion forward. But um, you know, part of this and the whole discussion we just started about zoning priorities came apart came about because. Um, the discussion regarding Pat and I's zoning proposal got farther afield than just the zoning proposal. Um, and we needed a place to start discussing more than just wh what that proposed set of changes was. And so we're creating that within this. We haven't, I, I can't answer it more than that because we haven't really delved into what anything might look like that comes to the council or how we're really going to get to anything other than starting a conversation at this point. So I, unfortunately, I can't provide you much more than that. Uh, all the feedback is definitely helpful, though. Andy, any further comment? No, but thank you, Mandy. Pam? Yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the one of the ramifications of lists like this, it was it was quickly learned that um, there are in fact real impacts to staff time, staff energy, and um, and I think as we go forward, looking at again, someone mentioned you know bringing in the planning board priorities, and again our priorities, but recognizing that. Um, not every not every suggestion is a viable and good one. And so having to sort through uh, lists like this um, does take time. So I think that was something first council learned, and many of these were were uh, elements that were tried out, tested, and didn't really pass muster. So again, a really good reason to not leave them, you know, standing on a stagnant list. 
Shalini. Um, in response to this question, I just want to um, mention that when we had started out as a CRC, we did create a matrix where we put down, a, you know, all the different carry forward priorities, but we all had also invited town staff and we got a list which was specifically for um, comprehensive housing policy, how to implement it, but that came from Chris Bestrup, some suggestions. So we're definitely inviting the town uh, staff as well. Okay, Dorothy. Um, <clears throat> I've been asked a lot of questions about zoning um, by members of the public. And I think the question was, <clears throat> Why weren't we the wasn't the planning board uh, initiating zoning? And and I thought, well, you know, they did. I remember they had a plan for the the BL, and I remember plans and designs. But um, this last big round of zoning um, did not come from the planning board, and um, has been moving around in a way that that I can't figure out why it goes here and goes there. Um, the process to me has been a very very confusing one. So I support reducing this list because it is confusing but um i i have i i think maybe that we need to have a little clarification how zoning um proposals should come and the role of the planning board who are in fact planning professionals um that's not who we are we are elected people citizens who are not planning professionals, um, who may have experience. I mean, I think Pam Rooney has experience in this area, um, but our job is to, to look at it and to think about how would that work in the town? So I, I just think there's been some confusion as to how things are going. It's because the public has been very confused. And I have to admit, I have to, having been on CRC, I've been lately quite confused. Thank you. Pat? Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, have two short comments. Um, Pam, you said, Pam Rooney said, you said that there was nothing on the list that w worked out or was worth uh, following. And I seriously disagree with that, particularly around uh, duplexes and uh, really working on uh, affordable duplexes and owner occupied duplexes. That's on this list. Uh, and in terms of Dorothy, uh, <laughs> the planning board does an amazing amount of work. And yeah, they're more professional than I am, but they don't do everything. And at times they're very limited in their view. And I'll go back to the solar moratorium that I tried to get through and which was um, went to the planning board and the planning board said, oh, we have everything we need in place. We don't need any kind of solar bylaw you go back and listen to the meetings, they said that. And so the moratorium failed. And then they decided, oh, well, maybe we do need. Now, the ZBA was asking for guidelines, but the planning board said, we don't need, we already have enough. But they went back and began to work on it. So if us non-professionals don't speak out about things that are important to us, then we, we don't challenge in a positive way any planning board or any committee. Uh, and I, I think uh, this dismissal of, of uh, lay person's uh, knowledge, uh, all kinds of life experiences contribute to what we know about uh, housing or affordability or needs of the community. So don't, don't uh, minimize it. Pam? Yeah, thank you. I need to re respond to that. I did not say that these were all, you know, bad items. I said a number of these were were tested, tried, did not work out, and that's another good reason to take them off the list. I wasn't being all inclusive. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more comments or questions? Shalini? Um, just... Uh, Oh, I, I just want to reiterate what Mandy Jo just said in response to what Dorothy Bam said, just because just so we are all on the same page. I think in CRC, what we agreed was that our um, approach to um, making these changes has shifted, Dorothy, that 
as counselors, we are in touch with what are the challenges that our residents are facing, our businesses, students are facing. And so we are approaching it more from highlighting what are the challenges we're seeing and then inviting staff and planning board to uh, help us figure out the solution. So we're not driving with the specifics, but more with what the challenges are. Are there any comments or questions at this point? This is a rescission of a previous council uh, vote. Seeing none, uh, I'm going to then go to the voting. Shalini? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johan? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Pam Rooney? I lost my mouse. Yes. Uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. It's unanimous. Um, the next one, since we have it right up here, let's just move it on to refer the proposed amendments to zoning. Oh, I'm sorry. To uh, motion is to discharge the CRC and postpone indefinitely. The portion of the following referral made on June 28th, 2021, partially reported back to council on September 14th, 2021, and partially acted on by the council on October 18th, 2022, that relates to the definition of apartments in the zoning bylaw. Moved to refer the proposed amendments to zoning bylaw section 3.323, apartments to the planning board and the community resources committee for hearings held no later than September 1st, 2021, and for a written recommendation and an explanation as to whether the proposed bylaw is not inconsistent with the master plan for the plan from the planning board to the town council and to the community resources committee no later than 21 days after the planning board hearing and for the community resources committee to send a written recommendation to the town council and to submit all materials to the governance organization legislation committee for review of clarity, consistency and actionability within 60 days of the hearing held by the community resources committee. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo, would you like to say? I that? will explain the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So th this one is does not have a vote of CRC. Um, and I was clear in the memo as to why, but why I'm recommending it as chair um, that this council do this, um, which is because the last motion was recommended, this referral was still outstanding on CRC's docket. And having rescinded or recommended rescission of a zoning priority of considering the definition of apartments revision, it made sense to me as I was writing the report and looking at our outstanding referrals to make this recommendation or make this suggested motion. So let me explain what this motion is because it uses a lot of things we don't normally do. When a body refers something to a committee for report and recommendation, the body cannot take it back up until the committee has made that report and recommendation unless the body discharges that committee. So that's why the motion is to discharge the CRC. It's basically pulling the referral back from CRC. Um, and then the postpone indefinitely is a way to just essentially table it and do nothing on it at all. Um, <laughs> instead of voting on something, we can't actually vote on this. It was It was an actual zoning amendment. Um, legally, we can't vote on it because no recommendation, um, no hearing has been held in the last 90 days by the council. And so the council would have to hold a hearing in order to have a legally legal vote on a revision, a revision to the zoning bylaw. The original motion was to revise the zoning bylaw. Um, what happened with that was when it got to CRC, um, the planning board actually made its recommendation on the proposed revision but it got to CRC and CRC was really concerned about how the definition of apartments removing the 24 
unit limit to the definition of apartments would affect the potential for building apartments in the BG. And we worked through a whole lot of options and CRST still could not come to any type of resolution on how to um, allow the flexibility of apartments in non-business zones while keeping the preference to multi um, to mixed use buildings in the business zones. And we just couldn't come up with a solution that everyone liked. I think we went through four or five different ones. Um, and so it just kind of sat there and we said, well, we'll come back to it. Well, we just rescinded the recommendation to work on and advise, revise the apartments definition. This has been out there for um, two years about now. Um, and you would have to, in order for the council to vote, CRC or the council would have to hold another public hearing anyway. And so if the council decides that revising that definitions of apartments is a priority, we should just start anew, <laughs> is my thoughts. And so I thought this recommended motion was entirely within the scope of the prior recommendation from CRC. And instead of taking time at another CRC meeting to make this recommendation, I just included it in the report. Dorothy? Um, I, that helped a little bit, Mandy Joe. but I, you know, I go to a lot of meetings and I swear that I've heard that we had taken care of the apartment, that we didn't need to do anything anymore because, or that it had been done. So I know that the big thing was the limit of 24, which is why many people did mixed use when they actually didn't have any real desire to be mixed use because they wanted a higher number, but somehow I swear I've heard that this had been taken care of and that we didn't need to do it anymore. So now Mandy Jill makes it sound like, well, it maybe really is a good idea, but it's just a lot of bureaucratic stuff we'd have to do by starting all over again. So I'm confused. Wasn't something done on apartments? So the, a portion of the zoning amendments that was included in this referral was voted on and adopted, mm -hmm. but the revision to the change in apartment in the definition of apartments was never adopted and never brought back to the council from the referral. In fact, if you look at CR, if you look at the um, the transfer memos and the transfer motions from the last council to this one, you will see that this motion always was on that list as saying definition of apartments still not complete or some wording like that. So we never did finish that. Mm -hmm. And in the new council, we never took it back up. It was just, I, I think Dorothy, you might've been on CRC during some of these discussions. There were things about overlays and the first 10 feet and right. exempting the BG and BL and they'd still have the 24 limit or not allowing apartments at all in the BG and BL. We went through like five or six different options mm -hmm. and we couldn't figure out what was best. And okay. so we kind of tabled it within our own committee. Mm -hmm. um, but now that the priority has been rescinded or and, and at the time I made this recommendation as chair only, recommended to be rescinded it made no sense to me to keep this mm -hmm. this particular zoning original zoning referral on the books and so the goal is to essentially take this one off the books and if the council and it comes back and wants to revisit that definition let's let's task the planning department and planning board with figuring out potentially their mm -hmm. solution to it that we can discuss again Okay. Is there any quick way to say what was changed in apartments? Uh, I understand now you're talking we changed about some of the permitting pathways, and I believe there might have been some. I'd have to go back to the what votes, but I know the permitting pathways in the RVC was changed from special permit to site plan review, and I believe in the BG it was changed from site plan review to special permit. Mixed right, use right. Definition. And, and we also actually dealt with mixed use as part of that. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Kathy. Kathy. Yeah, you. what Mandy just said, Dorothy, did happen. There are a few areas where they're allowed, where they weren't explicitly allowed um, in village centers. And North Amherst, the amazing thing is how many apartment buildings we have, and apparently they were never allowed, but I, uh, you know, it technically never allowed. But um, I just have a wording question. 
I understand the discharge, the CRC. Why postpone indefinitely and why not just rescind the way you did before? You know, I'm fine with getting rid of this, I, but it postpone indefinitely is like it's out in the hinterland as opposed to rescinding. So it's the choice of wording that I'm, that's my only question. I am for doing this. So this was, the last motion was to direct what we just, the motion we just voted on was to rescind a motion that directed the town manager to do something. This motion itself is only a motion to refer actual bylaw revision proposals. And so we can't really rescind, I, we could maybe rescind the referral, but that doesn't- That's what I'm just saying. But, but we, we acted on some of it already. So it makes it hard to rescind half okay. of a referral, which is why I figured we'd just pull it from CRC and then just postpone indefinitely, which means it's the way as, to kill it. You can't as... vote on the actual proposal because the hearing, it's a zoning proposal. And so- under state law, the council must hold its public hearing within 90 days of the council vote. And so we can't even vote to like do, to vote it down or anything under state law because we haven't had that hearing in about two years. So as long as our understanding is we're actually killing it, you know, I mean, it, it, in two different ways, um, I'm fine with this. It's, it's essentially just, what I had to read this wording. Yeah multiple times to figure out what are we putting it in the closet or you know what are we really yeah. doing with it but as long as it's gone <laughs> it's I, fine I just want to make sure that it's not on the list that on the last meeting in December of this year Ex we exactly. vote to carry that's, it over that's what the I'm next saying committee. is it really yeah. gone as is long it gone? as it's not on that list then I could yeah. vote I mean list. Athena can probably state but put my understanding of postpone indefinitely is basically it's just done Right, it's basically killing it with no action. Thank you. Shalini? I was just gonna say that what we did pass was the mixed use definition and uh, we passed inclusionary zoning, we passed uh, ADU bylaw and the temporary so zoning article 14, that was. Right. So I think that's a way of addressing uh, Dorothy who said, why do I remember some of this? And Dorothy, you remember correctly. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, I want, would ask if Mandy Joe would please explain if we discharge this now, I understand that her new proposal has a change to the apartment um, definition. And I am assuming that that is something that is starting from scratch, that she is going to treat that as part of her, her incoming zoning proposal rather than it being part of this particular effort that was that was generated back in June of 2021. Is that a correct understanding? Um, if I understand you correct, then I think the answer is yes. So this motion on the table only deals with that June 28th, 2021 referral. It does not deal with any other referral. Um, the, the proposal that Pam and Pat and I um, made that is currently in hearings at the planning board and CRC has one small definitional change to apartments, which is to change the number three to the number four. Um, that is under a different referral, so it should not be affected by this particular motion because this refers to a specific referral. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. yes. This one this one goes away. The bottom line is this goes away. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then we're moving to a vote. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam, uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Alicia. Lynn, I'm not sure she's still on the list. She's, I don't know. she's not on the, I don't think she's on the list of still. She's oh. here. 
Um, I'm going to skip her for the moment. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Alicia, can you hear us? So we have uh, 13 counselors. Can you present. hear me? Yes. yes. We didn't hear you. Okay. Sorry. My mute is. Um, okay. Um, yes. Sorry. Thank you. It's unanimous. Good. Um, without, um, I'd like to just continue on so we can just push ahead. Okay. Um, the appointments have been approved. We're up to committee and liaison reports. Uh, CRC, Mandy Joe. Um, just two things. Uh, first is uh, about a year ago, you referred residential permitting to us. I haven't talked much about it other than we're working on it. Um, we're almost done. We're hoping that within the next month or so, we'll be able to make a recommendation to this council. Um, on the latest draft, I asked the manager on Friday to send it off to KP Law for a legal review so that we could do our final edits on it after that. Um, there will be an extensive report written when it comes back to council. Um, appointments. This probably applies to GOL too, but... Um, ZBA and planning board are advertised on the bulletin board for appointments. We have three planning board impending vacancies, two ZBA full impending vacancies, and four ZBA associate member impending vacancies. We need everyone to reach out to their networks and get people and suggest and ask people to apply to these positions and fill out their community activity forms. Or we may have many openings come July 1 on these boards. I'd like the, uh, to ask the, the clerk to the council to just send all counselors those announcements so that we make sure we have the right ones so that we can send it out in, to our constituents. So we've done that in the past, but uh, if Athena could do that again, that would be great. And I want to say that I work working with Paul. We were able to put an announcement in the in the news mailing lists, and unfortunately, it did not generate applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pat, the reason Mandy Joe included uh, GOL is because we have to pay attention to the non-voting members of the finance committee. Got it. Okay, elementary school building committee, Kathy. We're meeting this Friday at 8.30, mainly um, to start to think about the work plan um, with the hopes that the school vote passes on May 2nd. We enter into design um, development and we're talking about three subcommittees um, and we'll have that as a discussion and a timeline. So if any of you are interested in what the next steps are, that's the discussion on Friday. Okay. Finance committee, Andy. Uh, finance committee, I guess uh, we'll skip going backwards because we took care of that today and go forwards. Um, obviously May 1st is the date that the town manager will uh, provide us with the budget for FY24. And uh, it, uh, of course, this is the general operating budget that includes everything except the one piece we did tonight on regional schools. Um, in the uh, report that was uh, is now in the packet, um, you see the list of the dates in which um, the committee has scheduled uh, department heads and um, heads of the superintendent schools and library director to come and talk about sections of the budget that are relevant to them. And uh, as in past years, uh, it's of interest to um, other counselors uh, to attend, which is why I um, gave you the dates and times of the meetings in the memo. Um, what has been uh, considered in the past and uh, frequently done is, uh, but it's really a matter for the council president uh, decision as to whether to post the meetings as council meetings. The only reason to do that, but it is an important one is 
bit of a quorum of the council um, is present by the time we have additional people there, then um, it allows all councilors to participate in the discussion. So that's a decision that's uh, beyond uh, my role. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we have our schedule set forward and a busy month ahead. So with the chair's approval, I will ask that we post all of those finance committee meetings when we're reviewing the budget as committees of the whole. Okay. And I've noticed that a number of counselors have been regularly attending, which is, I think, really useful. GOL, Pat? Yes, I think uh, the two things that we've spent a large portion of our time on have been a flag policy and also uh, public dialogue issues that have come up because of Supreme Judicial Court decisions. The memo is rather long. It's in your packet. Um, I will say that um, basically what happened in Boston is that they flew all kinds of flags without any kind of connection to anything. And a Christian group asked to fly a Christian flag. They were denied. And um, the court decided that that was... Uh, because they had allowed all these other things and didn't have a policy, they were basing their decision on content and that they really didn't have the right to do that. Um, but the um, in some of the important things that came out of it was um, at the same time, the majority um, emphasized uh, that the government speech doctrine is important and that the government is free to speak for itself to formulate policies and implement programs. And the court set out three factors, and this is what we're gonna be working on, to review and determine whether a government engages in speech when it invites outside groups to participate in a program. One is the history of the expression at issue. Two, the public's likely perception as to who the government or a private person is speaking. And three, the extent to which the government has actively shaped or controlled the expression. We require the flying of the flag to be supported by a resolution or proclamation. Um, and so, but we still need to refine and codify uh, how we're going to do this. The Supreme Judicial Court uh, in the Southboro decision um, talked, I, I won't go into the whole story about what happened. A selectman uh, and a resident got in an altercation uh, and they were both rude. Um, but the court analyzed both the 19th and 16th articles of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, uh, which provides rights anal analogous to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And it concluded that Article 19's reference to assembling in an orderly and peaceable manner is not the equivalent of polite and courteous discourse. So we've got to look at that. And it also analyzed Article 16, which protects the rights of free speech and applied a strict scrutiny in con uh, concluding the select board's civility code was unconstitutional. So then we roll down to, <laughs> so you can say any damn thing you please um, in public comment. Uh, but <laughs> what uh, I wanna share a quote from Lauren Goldberg, who was who met with us, and what she said, which is really important to us and the work that we'll be doing is the Southboro ruling really hasn't changed much. It, it's just that the notion of decorum has now been more linked more carefully and clearly to content. And that's important. Residents have the right to share what they think and feel, their content, and then we can't judge them during public comment on whether we agree or not. And she to an answers to the questions we had are not immediately clear, she said, and the committee is allowed to set rules that let it do its work, but those rules must not be content-based and rules should be clear and implied in a uniform manner. Um, so uh, I'm totally intrigued by both of these issues as is Jennifer, who's over there smiling. Um, they're really interesting, fascinating, and, and uh, complex. And uh, yeah, right. And the let me just ask, you also have snow and ice to bring back to the council. Yes, it's coming back. Uh, it's been held up uh, 
<laughs> into okay. the spring weather, mostly because we were not getting replies back from the tree warden and DPW, and we have some of that information now. We'll be working on that. Okay. Um, Kathy, I assume JCPC is finished and we didn't need to do a report because you included one last time. That's correct. Okay. It's done. Jones Library Committee, Anika. So the committee has not met, but I can share that the next meeting will be on Thursday, June 1st okay. at 4 p.m. Town Services and Outreach, Anika. Okay, so during our, our last meeting, we had a, a short but packed meeting. Uh, we, um, as you see, we referred and um, unanimously referred all of the town managers appointments and we're happy about a lot of the diversity and newness included in those voices. Uh, we did have also an update from Paul in regards to the proposed uh, hauler bylaw with some dates attached, so that was nice with um, Paul and um, lead sponsor Shalini. We did postpone the surveillance um, the surveillance policy, so that should be on either the next one of either the next or the next coming meeting. And we had an update from both Mandy, Joe, and Anna on the street light policy, uh, which was nice. We did also share, which we've gotten in the habit of sharing a lot of announcements and what's going on. One that I forgot to share earlier, which is that tomorrow uh, at 5:30 p.m. at Amherst College's uh, Pine Lecture Hall will be an event from our community member, Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker, physician, artist, author, filmmaker, um, or activist, all around amazing community member. And so that will be, uh, this will be a talk and a screening of her film, Ashes to Ashes. And you'll also get a taste of what's next for her, um, which is also great for um, our community here. So that's tomorrow night, it's at 5.30 p.m. And upcoming agenda items continue to be the proposed uh, streetlights policy, the proposed um, color bylaw, and the surveillance policy. Okay. Are there any questions on any of the council re committee reports? Are there any liaison reports? Jennifer? Um, I just briefly, um, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust met a couple of weeks ago, and they had a terrific presentation by GSD Studios out of um, Dover and Durham, uh, New Hampshire, and it was um, on tiny houses. And actually, tiny houses, um, they're kind of cottage clusters, and it was fascinating, and um, I really hope that's something we could pursue here in Amherst. Um, and uh, let's see, the, uh, uh, the Housing Trust and the Community uh, Resources Committee will be meeting together to also address how we um, affordable and attainable housing in Amherst. And I hope that tiny, ha tiny houses can um, you know, be part of that. And then the last item that they um, spend a good portion of the meeting discussing is that there is going, the town is going to be hiring um, a position in the planning department that will um, a certain percentage of that planner's time will be, I don't know if it's actually a, a planner or if it's a different position, but we'll be working with the housing trust to really, um, you know, proactively look at developing affordable housing in Amherst. So that's exciting. And that's it. Uh, Michelle? I'd like to give a report on the AHRA um, and just share that our survey is almost two weeks. We're almost two weeks into our survey. Um, we have, as of today, 407 responses um, with 50 respondents identifying as Black. Um, we're really happy with the response rate so far. Um, and we also would like to try to get um, the survey out to more folks who identify as Black. So if you know anyone who may be interested in the survey, I'd really, uh, we'd all really appreciate if you could pass it along. Um, and I also wanted to share that we are on track um, to have our final report and recommendations to the council um, by June 30th. So uh, that's the report for tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Dorothy? I just wanted to refer you to a, a very detailed report from the CSSJC and the HRC, the Human Rights Commission, um, which has uh, many items. It's a, it's a very clear, well-written report. Um, wanting to see some things moving forward, um, not to ignore or to start over the work that some of the work that this uh, CSWAG did, um, just because that could cause an unneeded delay. Um, and some of the points are, of course, uh, wanting to move forward on things that have been agreed upon. Um, and um, also urging that Cress, and I, I don't know how we're gonna do this financially, but um, it's really being very successful that it could be able to be 24-7, um, which would involve more hiring. Um, and worry, uh, as we worry about a lot of things, that um, some of the special monies that have come to the towns um, during COVID, uh, special grants are maybe going to be disappearing, and how do we, you know, get dedicated line item money? Um, also, concerns about moving forward on the youth empowerment center, um, and um, you know, we talk about it, and I know that there's again the financial responsibilities, but I think we need to get some more good conversation on on how, what way the town is going to proceed. But it's it's a well written report, and I recommend it to you. Uh, also, just uh, to remind you all to show up on the steps of Town Hall on Thursday, four o'clock, for the Jewish American Heritage Month proclamation. We will have uh, for refreshments, and we're going to have live klezmer music, and uh, maybe some good words from the rabbi. So um, I hope you all can can come. That's it. Thank you. Um, uh, we've approved the minutes already. Town Manager's report, Paul. Anything you want to highlight for us? Sure. It's not a written report this time. It's, right next week. Yeah. Um, just a few things. It's uh, for Jennifer. It's the housing coordinator position is technically what the what the term is. Um, so Anika already talked about um, Jennifer's award, which is really exciting. Um, uh, Brianna was on vacation last last week, so we we will be putting out a press release on that to get more attention for that really remarkable uh, award for her. So congratulations. Um, April is Volunteer uh, Appreciation Month. There is a lot going on to appreciate volunteers in our community. The Survival Center did the Empty Bowls thing, which included a lot of um, uh, volunteers. The Senior Center had a really nice dinner uh, last Thursday uh, to thank all the volunteers, and they had gotten a grant to do that. To do and and so I just want to also to all the people who volunteer their time uh, to the town. Just want to thank everybody for the that effort. The town doesn't run on a staff; it really runs on the volunteers that are here, uh, attending all the meetings, shaping policy, and helping to guide the work that we do. Um, the uh, and speaking of which, uh, you already talked about the need for ZBA uh, members. ZBA is going to be very busy this summer. We really do need ZBA members to be appointed. We anticipate there'll be two comprehensive permits being uh, submitted to the planning board um, this this summer. And it's really important that whoever starts the hearing continues through the um, length of the hearing. So we need to have folks who are gonna be able to commit their time to see these projects through to conclusion. And that can be many months. So um, I appreciate the effort that you're putting into recruiting really strong people to um, have the who have the time and uh, the the um, the approach to think about how these things impact our community, our neighborhoods, and our community. And um, just also just like last Saturday was a really interesting Saturday. It was a classic Amherst Saturday. We had the opening of the farmers market, which was the the biggest opening that they have ever had. Um, it was it wasn't even a gorgeous day. It was just overcast, um, but it was really busy, the largest number of vendors they had that early in the season ever. Um, a, a broad array and a broad array of, of vendors, plus new people coming in with lots of vegetables and things that they're offering. Same time or a little bit later, there was the sustainability fair, which was a big success. It wasn't as big as it has been previously because it's it's the first time back in person, but uh, credit to Stephanie Ciccarello and all the people who helped support that to make that a, a really nice event. Um, then, um, you know, the, the police department was doing the drug um, take back day at Wildwood School from 10 to 2 that they, they really did a really terrific job with that. Um, 
And then there's these other things in town that just sort of like there's a livestock fair at the Hadley Farm at UMass runs, which was just fascinating. And 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 then there was the um, Bach Symposium and Bass and B Minor at UMass. So it's, 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 so to me, it was like such a classic Amherst dat day because you had the farmer's market, sustainability fair, farm animals, you know, classical music or, or religious music and just everything coming together. So it's, it's, it was a fun day for everybody, I think. And then Sunday was a washout, so. Are there any questions of the town manager? Um, with regard to the president's report, I do a written report for the next time. With regard to future agenda items, uh, I'm sorry, Kathy, you have your hand up. Having problems finding the raised hand. Paul, I have just a quick question, given everything else you're doing. Uh, Pre-COVID, or maybe even once during COVID, we did a town cleanup day in May that people actually loved. Um, so I don't know whether we might uh, May is just around the corner, but maybe we can do it in June. You know, up in the north part of town, we did all around Puffers and Mill River, but it was a real opportunity for people to get together with sacks and collect garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, those uh, community participation officers did that, organized that last year. And so I know that's on their thing, whether they can actually pull it off this year or not, um, but they have talked about it. So. Pat? Yeah, I just want to quickly say that uh, I was part of that day in my district, uh, and there were an enormous number of residents, but also student residents, groups of students all over town doing dirty work to help clean up Amherst. And I think that we need to remember to mention student volunteers over and over again, and they, they maintain or really fuel a lot of what happens at the Survival Center as well. Okay. Um, we meet next Monday night. The big agenda item is the town manager presenting the budget. Kathy, you have your hand up again. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to let you, but I, I had one announcement or reminder for people, but you can go with yours first. Okay. Um, uh, that is the major agenda item. I'm going to also push out again the survey. Uh, to see who is available to meet on the 10th of May. It'll be a meeting of the council. We will have a presentation, brief presentations of the uh, report that the town manager made uh, with regard to items we outlined on November 14th and CRC, CSSJC and HRC ha will have a written response as well. Uh, at this point, we do have, I believe, a quorum, but I have to clarify that and also make sure that other counselors who have not responded yet, let me know that. Um, other than that, I have no other comments. So, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know when to raise my hand. Um, just for those who didn't go in the special invite for the town council to look at the Ball Lane site, for first-time homeowners, they're doing it for the whole community on April 26 at 5:30, um, and it will be for people living in the area. But it's also a good chance for people who don't, for, for residents who might be a first-time homeowner, to come up and take a look at what's being proposed. And when they did this um, several months ago during the summer, they had uh, like. They weren't children's blocks, but they had little housing blocks, and you could move them around to see what this. So it was really fun. I mean, it it wasn't just a oh here's a piece of land. Imagine what might go on it, and people got engaged in how would the clusters be arranged. So uh, encourage people to come who might be interested as well as if you want to see the site. It's a terrific site. It's it's wednesday it's, it's, five. it's april 26 at 5 30. right which is and this there's wednesday. there's overflow parking um the the mill district has offered overflow parking if there's not parking right near there it's a pretty short walk to uh to to get to the site so but don't turn on ball lane <laughs> right don't turn on ball lane time. are there any other councillor comments Uh, we have no unanticipated items. We do not have an executive session. 
this meeting is adjourned. It's 821. Yeah.